Hello and welcome. It's your friendly neighborhood narrator, Sue, here. Get cozy as I share with you. Sometimes terrifying, sometimes heartwarming, but always thought provoking encounters of Bigfoot, Dogman, and the straight up paranormal. I post new videos every day, so be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And with that, let's get right into it. I woke up early on a Saturday morning, excited to embark on my first Boy Scout camping trip. I'd been looking forward to this for weeks, and I couldn't wait to spend the weekend in the great outdoors with my fellow scouts. As I packed my backpack with all the essentials, a sleeping bag, a tent, clothes, and food, I felt a sense of anticipation building inside me. This was going to be an adventure. We met at the local scout hall and loaded up our gear onto a bus. As we drove out of town and into the country, I could feel my excitement growing. We were headed to a remote campsite deep in the woods, and I couldn't wait to explore. When we arrived at the campsite, we quickly set up our tents and got to work building a fire pit. We spent the rest of the day learning survival skills, how to start a fire without matches, how to purify water, and how to navigate using a map and compass. As night fell, we gathered around the fire and cooked our dinner over the flames. The smell of the sizzling sausages filled the air, and we laughed and joked as we ate. It was a simple meal but it tasted amazing after a long day of hiking and learning. After dinner, we sat around the fire and told stories. Some of the older scouts shared tales of their past camping trips, while others told ghost stories that made us all shiver with fear. As we sat there in the darkness, surrounded by nothing but trees and stars, I felt a sense of camaraderie with my fellow scouts. We were all in this together. As we crawled into our tents for the night, I could hear nature all around me. Crickets chirping, owls hooting, and leaves rustling in the wind. It was a peaceful sound, and I felt myself drifting off to sleep. The next morning, we woke up early and set out on a hike through the woods. We followed a trail that wound its way through the forest, past streams and over hills. Along the way, we stopped to identify different plants and animals, and we even saw a deer grazing in a clearing. When we returned to camp, we spent the afternoon practicing our knot tying skills and learning how to use a hatchet safely. It was hard work, but it felt good to learn new skills and to challenge ourselves. As the sun began to set on our final night at camp, we gathered around the fire one last time. We shared our favorite memories from the trip and talked about what we had all learned. It was bittersweet. We were sad to be leaving, but also excited to go home and share our experiences with our families. It was my first Boy Scout camping trip and I was excited to spend the weekend in the great outdoors with my friends. We spent the first few days learning survival skills and exploring the woods. We set up our tents near a small river and spent our days fishing and swimming. As night fell on the last day of our trip, we gathered around the campfire to share scary stories and roast marshmallows. We were all having a good time, laughing and joking around, but then we heard a rustling in the bushes. We all froze, listening intently. At first, we thought it might be a deer or a bear, but as the rustling grew louder, we could tell that it was something much bigger. Suddenly, we saw movement in the trees. Something was moving towards us, something big and shaggy. We all stood up, our hearts pounding in our chests. As the creature emerged from the trees, we could see that it was not a bear or any other animal we had ever seen before. It was tall, at least 
seven feet tall, with long arms covered in shaggy fur. Its eyes glowed in the firelight, and it stared at us with an intense curiosity. We were all scared out of our minds, but we didn't know what to do. The creature just stood there, watching us. It didn't look aggressive, but it was not something we wanted to mess with. We slowly backed away from the campfire, hoping the creature would just leave us alone. But it followed us, step by step, its eyes fixed on us. We could hear its heavy breathing and feel its presence looming over us. Finally, we reached the edge of the clearing. The creature stopped and watched us as we retreated into our tents. We stayed up all night, huddled together in fear, listening to the creature moving around outside. The next morning, we packed up our gear and left the campsite as quickly as we could. We didn't talk about what had happened until we were safely back home. But even then, we couldn't explain what we had seen that night. Years later, my friends and I still talk about that camping trip. We still wonder what that creature was and where it came from. And every time we go camping, we keep an eye out for any signs of Bigfoot or any other mysterious creatures that might be lurking in the woods. Despite the fear we experienced that night, we all became fascinated with the idea of Bigfoot and other cryptids. We started researching sightings and stories, and even went on a few expeditions to try and find evidence of their existence. One summer, we decided to take a trip to the Pacific Northwest, where there had been many reported Bigfoot sightings. We spent weeks hiking through the dense forest, setting up cameras and recording equipment in hopes of capturing some evidence. One night, we were sitting around our campfire when we heard a strange noise. It was a low growling sound coming from the nearby trees. We all froze, listening intently. Suddenly, we saw movement in the trees again. This time, it was much closer than before. We could see the outline of a large creature moving through the underbrush. We quickly grabbed our cameras and started filming. The creature was too far away to see details, but we could tell that it was massive and covered in fur. As it moved closer, we could hear its heavy footsteps and smell its musky scent. It stopped just at the edge of our campsite, watching us with its glowing eyes. We were all terrified, but also excited to finally see something that could be evidence of Bigfoot. We continued to film as the creature slowly backed away and disappeared into the woods. When we returned home and reviewed our footage, we couldn't believe what we had captured. The video showed a large, bipedal creature moving through the forest, just as we had seen with our own eyes. While we can't say for sure that what we saw was Bigfoot or another unknown creature, it was an experience that none of us will ever forget, and it has only fueled our fascination with the mysterious creatures that may be hiding in the wilderness. I hope you liked that encounter, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button. Okay, on to the next one. My encounter happened in 1973, when I was only 20 years old. I haven't written it down or sent it in yet anywhere, but I have spoken about it a lot throughout the years. I've noticed that recently, like in the past 20 years, it's more acceptable to be able to talk about these things publicly. When the encounter happened, there were whispers of and rumors about Bigfoot in the woods near my home in rural Indiana, but it was much less common to hear people openly talking about encounters. There is a whole community that seems to have sprung up around him now and sightings are more popular than ever. This is my story exactly as I remember it, and the more I talk to people about it, especially in the area where I still live, 
I find there are so many people who have had very similar experiences. I was invited to go and help my uncle renovate and somewhat rebuild some old cabins that were located on some land that he had recently purchased. The land itself wasn't too overgrown, and I'm not sure if the place used to be a summer camp or something similar, but there were several abandoned and beat-up cabins in one area of the property. I agreed to do it. I was only 20 years old and needed to make some money, so that would be my job for the summer. My uncle paid me well, and I had worked with him throughout the years leading up to this, and it was always a nice time. We were going to renovate the least damaged cabin first in order to have a place to stay while working on the other cabins and the rest of the land. This property was in the middle of nowhere, and it wasn't easy to get to. My uncle had a plan to renovate and modernize the cabins, and possibly rent them out, either seasonally or for people to live in them full time, depending how it all went. My uncle gave me the locks and new doorknobs to go and put on first before anything else. I had a bunch of other materials already there, and I left on a Friday evening. I arrived at the cabin late at night, around 10 o'clock. I hadn't ever been there before, but my uncle had. He had dropped off the materials and left them in a few sheds he also brought to the property. I walked around a little bit and thought it was a bright night with the full moon and the stars out. It was fairly dark. There was a lot of tree coverage all over the grounds, and it was hard for me to find the right cabin. The units were a lot larger than I'd originally expected but they were all numbered. I finally found cabin number 10. There were 12 of them, and I made my way to it. I had a big flashlight and a little toolbox so that I could put the new locks on this door, since this is where I was staying while I helped my uncle with this project. I changed the lock and took my things inside. I immediately noticed that something was very weird inside of at least this one unit. In the middle of the kitchen, there was a giant stack or pile of sticks and leaves. It looked like a giant bird's nest, and I couldn't even walk around it to get to the other side of the room. I kind of just stood there at first and stared at it. I hadn't ever seen anything like this before, and honestly, I didn't know what to make of it. Like I said, I immediately recognized it as a nest of some sort, and all I could think of was what kind of animal would be able to not only construct something this big, but what type could maneuver getting inside of the cabin itself. The locks were broken, yes, but it wasn't like you could just push the door open. You had to turn the knob, and I couldn't wrap my head around it. I was a little scared but couldn't exactly leave or call anyone. This was long before cell phones, and I was literally in the middle of nowhere and all by myself. I decided to just take it down. I basically just tore through all the sticks and leaves and ripped it down. There wasn't anything intricate about it, but it had me curious enough that I wanted to know if there were similar structures in the other cabin units. I tore down the one in the kitchen of where I was staying and decided to go out and check the other ones. There weren't any locks on any of the doors and they were all close enough together that it wouldn't take me too long and wouldn't take up too much time to go and see. I put all the remnants of the strange structure into a large garbage bag that I would normally use for leaves and yard work. I then started checking the other cabins. I checked the closest five and sure enough, there were the exact same type of structures in those ones. It was late, and I was tired, and I decided they were most likely in all of them. I had no idea what they were or where they could have come from, but at that point, it was so late, and I was so tired, I decided to call it a night. I went back to my unit and set up in the bedroom. 
My uncle would be arriving in the afternoon and would be staying in the unit next to me. So as soon as I woke up, I had to go over and get his cabin ready for him. I sat up in the bedroom and laid down to go to sleep. I must have fallen out quickly. I didn't stay asleep long. I kept hearing strange noises. I jumped up to what sounded like someone banging on the front door. The cabins were all one bedroom, and the bedroom was a separate room with another door located in the back. There were no actual people around for miles and miles, and there was no way any animal was banging on the door. It sounded honestly like the cops were knocking. It immediately startled me, but I remember my immediate thought was that it was lucky that I'd replaced the lock. I got up and quietly went to the front of the cabin to listen by the door. Sure enough, the banging came again, but this time was accompanied by strange growling and scratching sounds. I was scared. I was scared, don't get me wrong, but I was also curious, and my curiosity won in the end. I decided to try and peek out the window to see if I could see who or what was at the front door. By the time I was able to do that, though, the banging had moved on to the side of the cabin. Within minutes, the entire cabin was almost shaking. Something was outside, and there seemed to be more than one, because every single wall of the cabin was now being slammed into or banged on, and there were also strange, shrieking noises. Something was trying to get in. I was about to make my way to one of the windows to try and see what was happening, but before I could do that, once again, something happened that stopped me in my tracks. Huge rocks started coming in through the windows from all sides of the cabin. I immediately got down onto the ground and took cover. There was glass flying everywhere. I was so confused, and I had no idea what was happening or what to do next. The assault on the outside of the cabin walls went on for about 10 minutes, and by the time it all stopped, every single window in the place had been smashed. I assume it was a fist or a few fists had also been put through the windows. Some of the shards of glass had what looked like blood on them, but I'm not sure. Maybe it was just dirt. I wish I had saved a piece of it, and it's something I regret very much. People always get annoyed with me at this point in the story because of all the evidence we could get if I would actually had got the blood of a Bigfoot. We didn't have the same technology back then, and also, I stated previously, there wasn't as much focus on it or any sort of community around it, it being Bigfoot. It took me a couple of minutes before I stood up, but when I finally summoned the courage to do so, I immediately went to the windows to see if there was anyone or anything out there still. Something had assaulted the cabin and completely vandalized it. It wasn't a human being or several human beings, and I knew this for an absolute fact, because the strange animalistic noises that I heard the entire time it was all happening. I made my way to one of the windows in the room near the front door. I looked out and didn't see anything right away. However, it only took a few moments for me to realize something strange was still happening. As I stood there, still in somewhat of a panic and state of complete and total shock, I was also being watched. I looked up and saw what I can only describe now as a Bigfoot looking down on me from one of the trees. The creature was absolutely massive. It had to have been 12 feet tall and half as wide. It had very long arms, and though I couldn't make them out, the general description of it, it was still very dark outside, so making out any features of the face or anything like that was impossible. It occurred to me that I could get my flashlight and shine it out there, but I was terrified now, and I thought that maybe that would agitate the creature, and then I would be in more trouble. I understood now 
why, though the windows were completely broken, nothing had come through them. If it were a human trying to break in, they would have smashed out the windows and come in through them. This creature was way too big and never would have fit through the frame. It knew I had spotted it, and it started to howl very loudly. It wasn't like anything I'd ever heard before, though, and I can't even compare it to any other howl of the other wild animals either. It was unique in and of itself, and it seemed almost human. It sounded almost like a human being howling in pain or something like that. Then there came the responses. From at least ten trees came ten more of the same type of howl. They were communicating with each other, and I somehow just knew that all of them were staring at me now. I slowly backed away from the window, and one by one I heard loud crashing sounds. They were jumping out of the trees. I wanted so badly to see where they were going, but my head was spinning, not only with the realization of the damage that had been done to the cabin I was supposed to be renovating and living in for the summer, but a few other things had come crashing in on my brain too. I was thinking so many things all at once. I was wondering how the tree branches the creatures were standing on when they were watching me didn't break or snap under the pressure of the weight of the massive beasts. I was grappling with the realization that the nest I had disassembled earlier in the night must have belonged to one or more of these creatures, and they must have been wondering what the heck I was doing there. I was technically in its home, in its shelter. I was at a loss, and starting to feel really dizzy. I summoned up all the courage that I could muster and went toward the window. Slowly but surely, I swear on everything I hold dearly, the creatures all went into the other cabins, at least the ones that were visible to me from that one window. I ran to the bedroom and looked out the other side, and sure enough, they were entering those ones too. There must have been at least one creature per unit. They were living in the cabins, and I had trespassed on their territory. I didn't know what else to do but to lay back down and at least try to rest until my uncle arrived later on. I don't know how I fell back asleep after all of that, but I must have because the next thing I remember, I was waking up in bed and the sun was shining brightly through the now broken windows. I jumped up quickly and ran outside. I went into every single one of the other cabins and checked to see if the creatures were still there. It was approximately 10 in the morning, according to my watch, and I had wondered if maybe I had dreamt it all. I realized that makes no sense because the evidence of what had happened was all around me, in the now destroyed cabin, but my brain just couldn't make sense of it all. I noticed scratches all around the sides of the cabin I was staying in on the outside as well as all of the damage to the inside. I went around into the other units and while the shelters were still there, only remnants were left. It's like the creature knew their space had been infiltrated and they were trying to get rid of the evidence of them being there and possibly knowing what I know now, their existence in general. This is why I still believe to this day Bigfoot is extremely intelligent and they know that we are trying to prove they exist and they, for some reason, are trying to make it impossible for us to do so. My uncle arrived later on in the afternoon, and I explained everything to him. He was more excited than anything else, and really was just hoping we would see at least one of them again. However, that one encounter on the first night I was there was the only one I've ever had with them, and my uncle never got to see one. We even left one of the cabins, as it was when we first got there for the whole summer, but none of the creatures ever came back. I am writing this down not for validation, as I know what I saw and don't need anyone to believe me, but I am doing it so that it can be documented all that happened. 
Well, let's be honest. It's my word only, and no one who hears this will really know me and know how sincere I am. I hope that it could maybe help somebody else because I was somewhat traumatized for a very long time. I hardly ever thought about it, but when I did happen to just randomly think of what had happened to me, I would get something similar to PTSD. If a twig or a branch in the woods snapped and I couldn't see or didn't know anyone was around me, I would get pain in my chest and I wouldn't be able to breathe. It happened so long ago and now it doesn't affect me as much. I've had a few nightmares in the many years since it has happened, but other than that, I recovered well. I own that same land now, and the cabins are still there. I keep them for the summer and fall months, and my family and I go out there and spend time when we just want to get away from it all. My oldest son had an encounter with one of the creatures in the late 90s. His experience was much different than mine and happened during the day. Anyway, thank you for letting me share and get my encounter story out there. Are you feeling nice and cozy? Well, I post new videos every single day. And if you subscribe and hit that notification bell, you'll be notified every single time they go live. Okay, on to the next one. Of all the places this could have happened to us, it happened in Pennsylvania. My brother and I were driving late one night, going down south to Florida from college for the break. On the way, we saw someone standing by the road. That was weird for what time of night it was, but I didn't think too much about it until we got closer and saw that it was some beefed up, extra tall, ape-looking thing. Right off, my brother thought it was a guy in a monkey suit. He laughed and told me it was just some guy messing around with people driving on the road. But I saw two things that looked wrong to me. The first was that it had two very long arms. Both went down past its knees. The second was that its eyes were lit up. They were shining in the dark. That didn't look right at all. I told my brother, but he said I was wrong and that it was just some guy. It was standing like it was going to cross the road but got interrupted by us. Because of that, we got a side view of its body but with its upper body turned to us, looking at us. That's how I saw both of its eyes were lit up. The way it stood made it look like it wasn't even standing straight up. The legs also looked like they were kind of bent, even without standing up straight. If it was a guy, he could have set a world record or something for being tall the way he was. It was at the edge of the road when we saw it, but it turned and went into some trees away from the road when we got close. We passed by the place it was at when we first saw it. We could have just kept going, but my brother got it in his head to start slowing down. He wanted to stop and get a better look. It wouldn't have been a problem to me if we just drove past it and nothing else. I could forget about it in a couple of hours. Stopping was something different. I thought it was a bad idea to want to stop and told my brother we should just forget about it and keep going. We were already late, but he stopped the car anyway and tried to look back to see where it went. We couldn't see it from where we stopped, and I thought that would be good enough for my brother to get going again, but then he backed the car up to around where we saw it before. I was looking for it too, because I thought it could be coming over to the car, and I didn't want that. We couldn't see anything because it was too dark, but my brother didn't want to leave. He got the idea to get out of the car to get a better look. My brother was a real tough guy. Nothing scared him, ever. So if he said he was going to do something like that, I couldn't just sit it out or back down. I didn't want to be messing with someone or something that big. But if I tried to back down, my brother would think I was scared. There was no way I could let him think that. That would be something different. I would lose faith. So I had to act tough the whole time. That's how I used to see things back then. I couldn't just sit it out or back down. You know what I mean? I had to act like I was cool with what my brother wanted to do, even though I wasn't. 
if that was a guy out there, then I didn't want to be dealing with him in the first place. He had to have a few screws loose because, face it, who does that kind of thing out late at night and so close to the road too, am I right? It wasn't Halloween, and I wouldn't want to be out there dealing with some big guy whose idea of a good time was standing on the side of the road in the dark, dressed up like some big ape-looking thing. We got out of the car, but didn't see anything. It could have been sneaking up on us for all we knew, but my brother just had to get a better look. He took out a flashlight that he had in the car, turned it on, and pointed it at the trees. It wasn't the best flashlight in the world, but it was dark enough outside to make it good enough, and something in the trees got lit up. My brother found it. He lit up some eyes that were looking at us. The eyes blinked, looked away, and looked back at us. Then we heard some kind of voice coming from it. That was a loud voice, man. It talked all fast and garbled. I mean, it sounded like it was saying something, but I couldn't make out what. It wasn't any kind of language I have ever heard before. It wasn't anything my brother had heard before either. My brother wouldn't quit. He wouldn't leave that thing alone. He laughed at it, the way it talked, and then started shouting at it. Then he picked up some junk or something from the road, I'm pretty sure it was a rock, and threw it at the eyes. My brother could throw hard and fast. I'm pretty sure he hit it straight on. The eyes disappeared for a second and then came back. The voice came back too. It talked louder, faster, and more garbled. It was talking a hundred miles an hour this time. I still didn't know what it was saying, but it sounded mad now. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist to know why. Who wants a rock chucked at their face? It kept going on saying something, but the eyes started coming closer too. I pointed that out to my brother. He waited for a moment for who knows what. Then he got it in his head that, yeah, if the eyes were coming closer, then that meant it was coming closer. And he got back in the car right away. I did too. When I closed the door, I heard it make a huge roar. I had to cover my ears because it was too loud, but that didn't help dial down the volume of that roar. I thought my head would explode. That thing out there was not normal, and it definitely was no guy. There's no way it could have been. My brother was already driving, but he was telling me something. I couldn't make out what he was trying to say because it was roaring again. When that stopped, I got it. He kept saying it was coming for us. We couldn't go that fast. We weren't traveling light either. A lot of our stuff was in the car, making it slow and heavy. Also, it was dark and rained earlier. That made it hard to go fast on that kind of a road. That also made it easy for that thing to keep up with us. I turned around in my seat, trying to look for it while my brother was driving. The only thing I could see was the big shape of something running behind us on the road. Sometimes I couldn't see its shape, but its eyes got lit up. When that happened, the eyes were how I knew it was still keeping up with us. We couldn't ditch it. Every time that I thought we ditched it, I saw I was wrong because its eyes got lit up again. There was one place where my brother was turning too fast and he had to hit the brakes hard. When he did that, its eyes started glowing red from the brake light. I never forgot what that looked like, looking back in the dark and seeing those red eyes. I saw that and I thought it was over for us. It would get us. We kept trying to get away from it and got to a part of the road where it started going straight for some time. My brother sped up right away to try to put some distance between it and us. It had no problem with that. It still kept up with us. My brother and I were losing it, man. We couldn't get how it could run so fast, but then we got going too fast. I don't know how much exactly, but too fast for it. We got out of there only because it stopped keeping up with us. I didn't see its eyes or its shape anymore, but I heard it let out another huge roar. It wasn't as close, so that time it didn't hurt my ears the same way to hear it like I did with the other roars before. We got away, but the whole thing that happened that night made me get sick to my stomach. That's the only time I ever saw it, but I still think about it. Other than you, no one else knows. 
My brother won't talk about it, and I've never told anyone before. It's not exactly the type of thing I go around trying to talk to people about. On to the next one. Gabrielino, Southern California natives who were settled along the Santa Ana River from their mountains just north of the San Bernardino to the Pacific Coast in the area that is now Los Angeles. In a book titled The Bigfoot Files, written by Peter Gatilla, gives us an evaluation on the beliefs of the Gabrielino First Nations of Southern California. It refers to some of their old legends and stories associated with what happens to have been Bigfoot or Sasquatch in the area that is now Los Angeles, California. The story from this book was apparently sourced from three other fairly old books. As mentioned in the book, the Gabrielino First Nations had referred to Taquis or Tawis, which basically translates in English to a giant hairy man-like beast with a terrible stench. This giant man-like beast seems to be able to also fit the description as a mountain devil. There is more than one place named after it based on Native American accounts, which the book also brings forth. These are probably among the oldest known stories told by Native Americans on the western shores of North America. According to accounts told to John Harrington, the Gabrielino had told of an area north of Chino between what are now the suburbs of Pomona, Laverne, and Claremont that they have called Toybiet, which translates in English to the devil woman who is there. In the 1770s, in records kept by the area's early Spanish priests, an area known to these First Nations as Rancho of the Devil is described as being in an area along the Santa Ana River, east of Chino. According to what these First Nations had told the Spanish priests at the time, and what Reed and Harrington had also later verified in these old records, a rather large portion of the Santa Ana River between Riverside and Chino was the adobe of what the Gabrielino had referred to as Taquis or Tawith. And a certain place in the south bank of the river was specifically called Tawith Puki, or in English, Camp of the Devil. Keep in mind that these are some very old stories told by the area's first original people that were documented by priests and early historians long before this area in and around Los Angeles County became so densely populated. It's also an original example of how some places in the U.S. are named after what the Native Americans refer to over and over again throughout early history as Mountain Devils, or what you and I know of today as Bigfoot or Sasquatch, the yet-to-be-discovered primate. It's fascinating that these stories were told to the area's first Spanish priest by this group of early Native Americans. It seems that when the talk of devils came up, these First Nations people were very much relating to a physical presence that they were having trouble with in their lives. One might also find the idea of Bigfoot or Sasquatch having been romping around these now very heavily populated areas of Los Angeles County sometime before the start of the 1800s very fascinating. On to the next one. In Geauga County in Ohio, we spotted him in our backyard at the time. We no longer live at that place now. Back then, my brother and I saw Bigfoot. It was the year we got hit with so much snow. We were coming back from our friend's house as young boys, 10 and 8 years old. The snow was very deep as we had to lift our legs very high to get through the snow. As we were finally getting through the thick woods behind our house and walking into our property, there stood a Bigfoot, staring the other way. My brother and I were shocked to see him, just standing out in the middle of our yard looking the other way. We heard about it before, and our very first thought was that he might attack us. I told my brother to start reaching for a stick 
under the deep snow, so we can defend ourselves. The Bigfoot was probably about 30 feet away from us. It stood nearly straight up, but with a little hunch. Its height was around six and a half feet tall with a build similar to a human frame. The Bigfoot had long brown hair on him, but not too thick as it was possible to see some skin under his fur. As we were trying to pull out the stick from the snow, the Bigfoot heard a noise and quickly turned around and looked at us in the eyes. At that time, I was very scared. Our hearts were racing and we were shaking. For about five seconds or so, he stared at us and we at him. His facial features looked to be a mix between a human and an ape. He didn't have more of a flatter face, but slightly darker colored and thick skinned like an ape. After the stare down, it suddenly turned around and, with superhuman abilities, ran around the house in just a few seconds at the most. The snow was deep, but it ran down our property and took a left turn around the house. It was like the snow never existed as he moved so quickly. I was totally amazed by how lightning quick he was. It took huge, long steps that convinced us we saw Bigfoot. Even if someone was playing a trick on us, there is no one in this world that can run through deep snow in a matter of seconds. This was the convincing point for us, but it's not over. After my brother and I made it back to the house, we yelled for our parents, but of course they didn't believe us at all. Two boys watching monster movies? Yeah, right. Who would believe us? But later that night, we heard him again, but this time... He was walking on the porch around our house. I heard the snow smashing down as it walked on our porch. Crunch, 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 and so on until it stopped right behind my window. We had bunk beds, and I was on the top, and my brother was on the bottom. There was a small push window immediately behind my head. I could feel its presence behind me, I think, but I'm not sure. It was looking in the window at me. I had so many goosebumps on my body. I just jumped out of my bed as quickly as possible, thinking he was going to ram his hand through the window to drag me out. As I ran out, my brother also followed me, and we raced into the living room where our dad always falls asleep at night on the couch. We yelled that the Bigfoot was out there again, and of course, dad told us to go back to bed and quit fooling around. It was past our bedtime. We kept yelling to him that we were serious, so he got up and looked out the sliding doors. He couldn't see anything outside and told us to go back to bed. We were too scared, so we slept in the living room on the floor. My brother and I never thought about going back outside that same day we saw Bigfoot and look for footprints. Everybody asks us that, but it just never dawned on us to do any of that. As the years rolled by, the images and details get more sketchier in my mind, but I am 100% convinced we saw him that day. The solid evidence for me is that he ran through that deep snow in just a few seconds. I'm a fairly serious runner, and I know for a fact that it is totally impossible to run through the snow like that. Bigfoot reminds me of a heron bird. You can never get too close to it, and it quickly takes off to hide. With the wood and park by the house and Nelson Ledges somewhat close by, I think he may be hiding at Nelson Ledges in the caves in the ground. But that's just a hunch. Personally, I have a hard time believing myself at times because I do not believe in evolution. But at the same time, I'm absolutely positive I saw him. I don't think we are ever going to find him unless we directly go out looking for him. So many people tell me they don't believe in it because no one has ever found a dead Bigfoot in the forest. But I say that it's just like many animals in the world. We don't see them laying all around in the yard either. If we found a Bigfoot though, it sure would be the catch of the century. The world would change dramatically if we were able to study them closely. The sighting was in the early afternoon. Lighting was still very visible. We could clearly see it with no problems at all. Then at maybe 3 a.m. or so, our two beagle dogs started barking and barking downstairs. Our dad woke up 
and went downstairs to tell them to shut up. When my brother and I followed our dad, we saw mud prints on the top of the sliding glass window as if Bigfoot was holding his hands on the window looking at the dog. It has been over 20 years since we saw Bigfoot, but I thought I remembered about some other kids seeing Bigfoot in a cemetery across the road from Pond Road right after we saw him. Across the road was very thick wooded area near Little Punderson Lake and Punderson State Park. On to the next one. This took place in the summer at a place called Klaus Lake in Perry County, Ohio. I was 10 years old at the time, about to turn 11. I was in the woods playing explorer with three other kids. All of a sudden, it got very quiet in the woods. We also got very quiet, but continued to walk through the woods. I was in the front, and we were walking single file. We were following a deer trail. It went around a large tree in the distance. I started to smell something very malodorous. I rounded the tree and almost ran into it. It was a huge, hairy creature, very smelly, over six feet in height, and dark brown in color. It was not a bear. It had an almost human face. The creature spun around, and I screamed at the other kids to go back now as fast as they could. We ran back to the parking lot of the lake as fast as we could. The bird and squirrels got quiet before I saw it. I also smelled something rank in the air, too. The other kids didn't see it. We were walking through the woods. I was leading and preventing the other kids from seeing it. Their view was obstructed by the large tree. It was mid-afternoon, clear and sunny, and we were in the middle of the dense wood. We were in the wood around Klaus Lake. The lake was not in view at the time. On to the next one. In Lehman, in Washington County, in Ohio, when I was about 10 years old, my sister and I were out in our yard playing a yard dart game, the kind where you throw the plastic flower onto a stake in the yard. The only reason I mention what kind of game it was is to let you know how vivid this still remains in my mind. But anyway, we were playing in the yard. It was close to getting dark, but still daylight enough so that you could still see. I don't quite remember if I heard a noise or what made me look across our road, but when I looked across the road on the edge of the woods, I saw an image similar to drawings I have seen of actual encounters. It was walking at the edge of the woods, kind of stooped over, using its hands to push the tree back out of its way. All I could do was just stand there and look at it, not really knowing what I was seeing. I really don't know how long I stood there, but I remember yelling at my sister, who was then seven years old, and telling her to run into the house. She then looked and saw the same thing. As soon as I yelled at my sister, it stopped dead in its tracks and just stood there and looked at us. My sister and I still remember the feeling of not being able to move. And to this day, we still get cold chills and our eyes water every time we talk about this. So anyway, we eventually ran inside the house. When we got in the house, I remember my mom asking what was wrong because she said that both of us were as white as sheep. We then went on to tell her what we had seen and were terrified to have her go outside and check things out. Neither of my parents ever saw anything, but still to this day, say they believe we did see something. Whether it was someone playing a joke or possibly a bear, I still think to this day that it was a Bigfoot or something similar. On to the next one. This is in Stark County in Ohio. I used to walk to my friend's house via a swampy area. One night around 10 p.m., I started walking to his house. About halfway there, I heard this very strange sound. It was like a low-pitched growl that became a high-pitched scream. Being only 12 years old, I started running my butt off back home, trying to get away from whatever it was. I could hear it following me, and there was a smell in the air that was awful. At one point, it sounded like it was 20 feet from me. 
I finally made it to my backyard and whatever it was never came out of the wood line to show itself to me. Then, about a month later, while riding my bike to my friend's house, the long way, I heard it again. That sound just made the hair on the back of my neck stand up just thinking about it. This thing just never seemed to go away during the summer months. My older brother thought I was pulling a fast one on him with this story until one night that changed his mind completely. He was out at the old makeshift cabin we built back there with a friend. They both heard something come up behind them, and when my brother turned around, it was right there. When they turned to run, the creature grabbed my brother and ripped a mark on his back. He had three claw-looking scratches about an inch or two long. They ran back down the hill until they hit the road, and just like before, it never left the cover of the wood. He said it stayed there and bellowed out an awful scream that scared them to death. I have never seen him that visibly scared in my entire life. One morning around 3 a.m., my brother slipped outside to have a smoke, since mom and dad didn't allow us to smoke. After about three minutes, I heard banging on the back door. Just before the banging on the door, our dog started acting very strange. It ran under the bed and started whimpering like something was wrong. When I opened the door, the awful smell was in the air. It was like a mix between a skunk and rotten flesh. My brother almost tore the screen door off the hinges. He looked back to the yard and said, look, there it is. I looked in the direction he was pointing and there was this huge, hairy thing walking out of the woods with the moonlight on its back. It looked around seven to eight feet tall. When it walked, it looked slumped over, and we could see its arms moving as it walked out of the woods and through my neighbor's yard. It was just one of the many things that happened by our house during three summers. This thing was coming around. The area was thick woods, hilly terrain, abandoned strip mines, and some marshlands in the area. On to the next one. I had a case of too close for comfort with a giant dog in Michigan one evening. It was about 30 years ago when I was working there. I was just minding my own business, driving along down the same rural road I always took when I thought I saw something heading my way. It was running in my direction from a field from the left and I realized it was coming straight at me. It looked like it was aiming for me and trying to get me directly where I was sitting in the driver's seat. It appeared out of nowhere and moved so quickly that I had only a few seconds to move out of the way before it tried to ram me. It came very close, but I avoided getting hit by it only at the last second. I swerved hard and nearly wrecked the car by driving off the road I didn't see where the dog went off to afterward, but I was able to get out of there because the car was still okay. It got close enough that I could see it was a giant dog, much bigger than any black bear I'd ever seen. Good thing I survived its attempt to ram me. With how big it was, that wasn't going to turn out in my favor. I didn't have much of a choice about taking that road. So I watched out for that dog every day following that one. I didn't see it again after that, but I'd never forget about it either. On to the next one. This was in Southwest Ohio. About 15 years back, my son and I were at the lake coming back from fishing. It was later in the day, but still clear. We were coming back when we heard a vocalization from across the other side of the lake. It was like a shriek or a screech and very loud. As a call, it also sounded more powerful than the call of any animal I knew to inhabit the area there. It would take a sizable animal to make a call like that one. I never heard anything like that before, and the way it happened, without any warning, made us both turn and look. We looked over to where we thought it came from and saw some deer burst out of the wood line and then run into the trees that were in the same direction they were already going in. We didn't see anything chasing them, though. We waited and looked over there for a while, 
but nothing else came out of the woods after the deer. We started to come back home again when there was another vocalization in the same area. It was closer, louder, and lasted a little longer. Whatever made it sounded angry and frustrated. We turned to look over there again and saw something big come out of the woods and lumber off in the direction that the deer went a little earlier, going into the same trees the deer went into. What we saw looked very hairy. The hair was brown and covered its body. It walked like it was hunched over forward to some degree, but it still looked very tall despite being hunched over in that way. Other than that, it was too far away and happened too fast for me to see any more detail. Considering how big it was, I figured it could have been what made both of the vocalizations we heard. We waited a little while longer to see if anything else was going to happen, but nothing did. We didn't see or hear anything like that on any other fishing trip. It was a one-time thing. On to the next one. I actually saw the Bigfoot several times in the St. Joe's National Forest as a child. These sightings are what made me go looking for Bigfoot as an adult, Tim said. The first time I remember seeing a Bigfoot, I was creek fishing and heard a boulder move. I looked over and saw the back of a Bigfoot walking into the forest. It was a giant. I thought the Bigfoot was very tall, about six or seven feet. I ran back to our camp and told my parents what I had seen. They didn't believe me when I said it was a Bigfoot. They thought it was a bear. But I had never seen a bear walk on two legs. Afterward, he would look for footprints scattered about the woods with his brothers and several times they found some. We were elk hunting one year when a Bigfoot crossed the road ahead of us. I saw the back of its head, shoulders, and rear going into the woods. He said his dad saw the same view and said, what the heck is that? I told him it was a Bigfoot, and that was what I had been seeing since I was a kid. My dad didn't know what it was at the time. A few years later, he was fishing with a friend. They were working their way up the creek when they both limited out on trout. Just then, they spooked something and it took off. I saw the back of this one again, and it was black, Tim said. We heard it jump the creek above us, where it was 12 feet wide. We found footprints on both sides of the creek. It went up the mountain, and we went back to camp where we packed up and went home. When Tim would hear wood knocks, his brother always said it was elk. Tim didn't believe him then. Over the last few years, he has formed the opinion that the Bigfoot uses the knocking to act as their early warning system. The Bigfoot will usually put a tree across the road if they are ignored. That same year, we went elk hunting and were coming out of a canyon a mile from camp. I was walking on a logging road, headed back to camp, when I heard a scream so loud it went clear through my body. It was like being at a really loud rock concert, he said. It sounded like a female screaming at the top of her lungs. I dropped to my knees. I looked everywhere, but I couldn't see anything. A few years later, he joined the Marine Corps where he spent eight years. When soldiers fired off rounds, the percussion went through his body like a wave. He said the effect of the sound he heard that day in the mountains was quite similar to the one he felt years later in the Marine Corps. However, this time, it seemed like it lasted forever. As I looked around, I had my gun safety off because I thought I was in extreme danger, Tim said. I have heard mountain lions, but this sound didn't compare to it. It sounded like a woman in distress, but I didn't think it was actually a woman. After being in the Marines, he took his girlfriend to his old stomping ground. He made an attempt then to locate the being that made the noise. By then, the area had been so logged out, there were no trees or foliage to hide behind there. He said they spent the second day driving his jeep around and looking at the snow in the hills. We found some big holes in the snow. They were off the logging road, and I got a bit scared. I was amazed at the size of them. It was then I realized we were actually seeing signs of Bigfoot. 
Tim had his gun with him, but realized the size of the gun wasn't big enough to do anything to the Bigfoot if he hit it. So he ruled that out. They turned around and drove another logging road. There, he found a cow moose with its spine and head on the side of the road and the carcass on the other side of the road. No meat had been taken from the carcass, just the innards. Then, Tim decided to take his girlfriend and go home. He came back to the same area two weeks later and drove where he saw the footprints. He stopped the jeep and was looking around when a cow elk came near the jeep, looking up the hill, completely distracted. I got out of the jeep with my guns and walked into the woods for a bit. I heard one long, drawn-out whoop on the left. Then there was another on the right and another down below. It was eerie. I emptied my gun into a dirt bank just to scare them away. A couple of mornings later, he left some apples on a stump by a creek. The next morning, they were gone, but a big rock had been left on the stump. I left because I got the heebie-jeebies, the same feeling I had in the Marines when death was imminent. Later, Tim said the last two summers he has looked but didn't see anything. However, the Forest Service has been actively logging off the area. He actually went up to where the rock was and pushed it off and took pictures all around the area. He returned to where he was staying and looked at the pictures, and he could see several Bigfoot in the pictures. Two weeks later, he went to the same place and took his binoculars. He also took the previous week's pictures and identified several Bigfoot in the nearby area. I watched them with my binoculars and took pictures with my cell phone. They watched me and didn't move for almost 10 minutes. I started feeling a little uneasy and realized there was one more somewhere. He wasn't sure where they were. He's bigger and has more hair on his face. I made my way to the Jeep. They never took their eyes off me. Tim said two weeks later he drove over again, but he was tired from work. He parked his Jeep to sleep for about an hour and was awakened by whistling. One of the Bigfoot was near the back of the Jeep and one was near the front. The one in the back was less than a hundred yards behind him squatting. Tim continues to travel to the same area often. He hopes he will see Bigfoot and maybe someday have a greater interaction. For now, he has no doubts as to that with which he is dealing. These things are real. I've seen them and I believe in them. On to the next one. The Mi'kmaq primary tribal range of the Mi'kmaq was Maine, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, as well as an adjoining portion of Quebec on the eastern side of the St. Lawrence River. From the University of Southern Maine, Professor Lauren Coleman's 2003 book, Bigfoot, the True Story of Apes in America, are very old observations from among the Mi'kmaq tribe to a deity they had greatly feared called Gagao. The stories of Gagao from among the Mi'kmaq tribe go all the way back to the French explorer Samuel de Champlain upon his first voyages to the eastern shores of North America in the year 1603. In his book, Coleman would note, in 1603, during Samuel de Champlain's first voyage to eastern Canada, the local natives informed the explorer of Gagao, a giant hairy beast that lived in the northern forest and was much feared by the Mi'kmaq. Coleman also writes of similar parallels to native African accounts of what was once referred to them as Gagai or Gila and what later became a real discovery with the very first specimen of what we all know today is the mountain gorilla from Africa. He notes the following as quoted, Native Africans told of their monster ape that allegedly kidnapped and killed natives, which is recognized by zoology today as the mountain gorilla. So we too have lessons to learn from the First Nations of North America about apes still in our midst. The Passamaquoddy tribe range was mostly throughout the regions of Maine and New Brunswick, going way back to the July-September 1889 edition of the Journal of American Folklore. In an article titled Superstitions of Passamaquoddies, 
are some very old details as what may be described as a Bigfoot Sasquatch from among the Passamaquoddy tribe of Maine and New Brunswick. A correspondent of the Lewiston Journal documented the following among members of the Passamaquoddy tribe from their priest, Father Odwad. Here are the following details on a phantom known as Ki Zegbiset from among the Passamaquoddy, as is noted from the article. A person whose conscience may smite him for wrongdoing sees a pair of red eyes staring at him as he tosses in his sleep. It is Ki Zegbiset. A drunk beholds in his frenzy some weird shape and cries out, See? Ki Zegbiset. Mothers believe that this direful hobgoblin tries to entrap their children. As more parents warn their children that if they disobey and go to some forbidden place, the boogers will get you. So mothers frighten their little ones with the name of Ki Zegbiset. They drive him away with the sign of the cross. He is only one of the supernatural beings they suppose to be hovering around them, intent on evil. The priest then notes the Passamaquoddy belief in he walk as he goes to describe the following detail. The Passamaquoddy's believe that up in the Canadian forest there lives a frightful and monstrous old witch called he walk who eats human flesh and has a merry feast when she gets a person in her fatal hug. Many a man's bones have been ground between her teeth, they think. When Kiwok is attacked by a man, the beast or spirit, she tears up a tree by the root and fights her opponent with the great trunk and branches. On to the next one. Near Midland in Beaver County in Pennsylvania, in October, a woman saw a Bigfoot with glowing green eyes. There were other reports of a strange animal in the area from other witnesses, and to make it uniquely Pennsylvanian, there was also a UFO sighting with landing site and three-toed footprints. On to the next one. In Fayette County, Pennsylvania, in October at 9 p.m., Stephen Pulaski and 15 people saw a hovering red ball of light which landed in a field on the Pulaski farm. Stephen was six foot two inches tall, 22 years old, and curious about the odd light, though none of the witnesses were frightened of it. Stephen decided to drive up into the field for a better look. A neighbor's 10-year-old twins went with him, and he took his 30 6 rifle with him. The ball of light was the size of a barn, and dome-shaped. It made a noise like a lawnmower. The headlights began to dim, and at the same time, the red light moved. It came directly onto the field. The red ball then became white. It was 100 feet in diameter. The three of them got out of the truck. One of the boys then saw a pair of eight-foot-tall humanoids with glowing green eyes. They were covered in gray hair, and one was seven feet tall, and the other was eight feet tall. Stephen used the six-foot-tall fence for comparison. Stephen fired his gun at them. There was also a smell of burning rubber and sulfur. The creatures whined together and were immune to gunfire, and eventually the smell of sulfur filled the air. The witnesses became physically distressed, lightheaded, and had difficulty breathing. Then Stephen temporarily went animal before passing out, exhausted after running around the field, growling, as well as attacking two investigating witnesses. It is not the first time for either combination, especially in Pennsylvania. On to the next one. A man was out running his dog when he saw Bigfoot at night and fired six rounds at it with his revolver, whereupon it vanished. He could hear the sounds of something running away, but could not see it. Later, he saw it again and shot at it with a rifle, and this time it screamed. From shock or pain, it was a tall, hairy, ape-like creature with glowing red eyes. On to the next one. In industry in Beaver County in Pennsylvania, 
Witnesses reported to the police the sighting of a large, dark, hairy creature with glowing green eyes. There was also heavy UFO activity at the same time in the same area. Is there a connection? On to the next one. Miss Thelma Arnold heard a clattering at her front door. She grabbed her 16-gauge shotgun and stepped outside and saw a seven-foot-tall, hairy humanoid standing six feet from the front door of her house. It had its hand in the air as if surrendering. Thelma was terrified. She fired a 16-gauge shotgun into its middle and it disappeared in a flash of light. Her son-in-law came over to investigate the gunshot and saw four to five shadowy forms in the bushes. They were seven feet tall, had very long arms and fiery red eyes that glowed in the dark. The dogs were barking. There was also a red flashing light seen hovering over the woods. On to the next one. Near Dawson in Fayette County, two 12-year-old boys who were cousins observed a large hairy creature approximately eight feet tall. They must have walked past as they looked back and thought over their shoulder at the same time. It stood in green briars with its shoulders and head well above the six-foot-tall green briars. It looked back at the two boys. It had long arms and its hair was dark brown, but not really long, though it covered its body from head to toe. The face was more gorilla-like than human. It was possibly 500 pounds. Bigfoot then took three steps through the green briars and was gone. When he looked, his cousin had run home. On to the next one. In Jumonville Summit in Fayetteville County in Pennsylvania, 13 witnesses in a car chased a Bigfoot that had looked at them and then hid behind a large stone. The creature seemed to move instantaneously from one side of them to the other. On to the next one. In Elizabethtown in Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, a 40-year-old man was driving into the trailer park around 8 p.m. when he saw a big gorilla in his headlights. It was apparently ambling through the park. On to the next one. In Elizabethtown in Lancaster County, Elizabeth Cahill, 28, had just returned to her trailer when she heard someone rapping on a window. Thinking it was a neighbor playing a joke, she opened the door, but instead of a neighbor, it was a gorilla-like creature that jumped out of the shadows and into the light at the end of the driveway. The creature started advancing toward her, and its eyes got shinier. Elizabeth ran her neighbors, Maurice Hiller and his family, who arrived with air rifles and their Irish setter. They found nothing or any tracks. Elizabeth described the creature as the height of an average-sized man covered with smooth-looking fur. The face was ape-like, and it stood with bent arms and legs. On to the next one. In Elizabethtown, after the cow sighting, but still in February, another woman stated that a gorilla-like creature had grabbed at her coat. The only way she escaped was by taking off the coat and leaving it in the creature's arms. We have no record, though, of a Bigfoot wearing a lady's coat afterward. On to the next one. Two local investigators were driving around northeast Pennsylvania, hoping to catch a glimpse of a Bigfoot-type creature reported in the area when they suddenly observed two dark figures with red glowing eyes approaching their vehicle as if attempting to circle around them. They managed to snap several pictures before fleeing the area. The pictures only vaguely show the eyes. On to the next one. Near Jeanette in Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, a male driver at dusk was driving on Route 130 when he saw what he thought was a German Shepherd dog running along 
The movement was more like an ape rather than a dog. A few seconds later, the dog stood up on its hind legs, and the motorist saw an ape-like creature on two legs and running into the woods. The creature was seven to eight feet tall with thick black hair. On to the next one. In Ben Salem, in Bucks County, in Pennsylvania, the witness and his wife heard a terrifying sound coming from the laundry room as if something were crawling its way up the drain pipe. Their dog went berserk and attempted to break out of the room. The next day, the witness went out to inspect the pipe when he found small tracks in the snow resembling small hoof prints. Starting in the middle of the yard, they went straight to the drain pipe and stopped. Earlier that summer, the witness was walking his dog on a field of tall grass along the street when the dog flushed out a creature that looked like a miniature kangaroo. No sooner had it jumped a few feet, it suddenly disappeared in plain sight. One year later, there was a terrific explosion in the wood directly behind the house blowing out the windows in an apartment across the street. The police never discovered its origins. On to the next one. Witnesses in Gibsonia in Allahanny County in Pennsylvania saw an eight-foot-tall creature with large green eyes peering into the window of a trailer. Claw marks were found high on a screen door and three-toed footprints were found near an abandoned tunnel in the area. On to the next one. At a little town called New Salem near Uniontown, the witness heard a large noise in the woods in front of their house. It was late at night and quite warm. The witness then looked down into the woods and saw a pair of very large red eyes looking back. They were too high up for a deer. The witness heard what sounded like long, slow breath. The witness went inside to get a flashlight, but it was gone by the time he went outside again. On to the next one. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!